Welcome to part two of my How to Play Morea by the Gypsy Kings video. In the first part, we learned the chords and the opening riff to the song, this thing right here. And now we're gonna tackle the melody, or just the first part of the melody, because most of the song is improvisation and not a written theme like the beginning is. So that's great for us because it's an opportunity for us to work on some scales. There's a key change in the song which can be challenging to solo over, so that's why it's such great practice. And at the end of this video, I'll give you a loop of the chords so you can practice playing all the stuff you've learned. Before we even play the melody, I want you to see a certain scale shape. And this is the only shape that we're gonna use in this song. That way we can keep it compartmentalized and really work on what's happening inside of that scale shape. So it looks like this. Okay, there's a lot of names we could give this scale shape and each one of those names would be incomplete in some way. Some people call it the Phrygian scale because this note represents the third note of the major scale, which is the Phrygian mode. Although when people say Phrygian, they really aren't saying it the right way because that is really Phrygian dominant is what they mean. That's a whole other can of worms. We could call it the A4 minor scale, the C4 major scale, all kinds of names you could give it. Um, just memorize it though and practice it everywhere that you can in every position. And a great way to practice is to go like this all the way up to the top of the scale, go up one fret and then come back down the same shape, entirely different key but the same shape. Now I'm up again. Um, because, you know, we all know as guitarists that things are movable. We know that intellectually. But you have to prove it to your fingers by moving it around or you'll never really get the shape down. This really scrambles our vision of the scale when you scoot it up one fret. And we're just ascending, scoot it up a fret, descend, up a fret, descend. And you should do that up and down the neck. Another tip for learning scales would be just use one finger. Here I am playing that same scale shape again. I'm only using one finger. And the value of that is that you're not memorizing a sequence of finger motions, you're really working on the scale as it is. When you're improvising, you're not only gonna play this note with this finger, for example, right? We might be sliding into that. So it helps you see it better and know it in a more abstract way and not just know it as a sequence of finger movements. Okay, so we have that scale memorized. We can see it in our heads. Let's go to the ninth fret, and that's gonna be an F sharp minor scale, we could call it, because a, this song begins in the key of F sharp minor, then it's gonna modulate down to E minor. Um, so if I play this scale here, we've got all the notes of F sharp minor. There is a problem though, and that's this note right here that's coming in on the next chord, and that's where the harmonic minor scale manifests itself. But don't worry about that just yet. Let's play the melody. So I'm here on the ninth fret. Now, if you can see the scale shape, that's why I told you to do that. This melody makes total sense. We're just looking at that scale shape. Everything is coming right out of those dots of the scale. All right, so I'm on the ninth fret of the first string. Play that twice. Tenth fret here. And that note is the root of the key of the minor scale. There's a chord right there that I'm visualizing as well inside of the dots of the scale. Then we go up these two strings into the second string, and that note is in the chord that's playing at that moment. Okay, then we move it down two frets to the left and do exactly the same thing, or just about exactly the same thing. Now that part in the song though, he does a little variation. He plays the ninth fret here, which was expected. Then he goes down to the eighth and comes back here. That's different than the first part, right? We had this. Now we're going down here, almost the same. A little variation right there. This melody happens more than once in the song. It's basically something that you can punctuate your improvisation with. And if you're playing with somebody else, you would play this opening riff, then we go to this melody, we're gonna improvise, and then come back by playing this riff, or maybe that melody again. That tells the listener that you're finished improvising or that a new section's coming up. But this song is made up of nothing but those chords we learned in the first video, repeated round and round and round. So that is the main memorable melody of the song. But after that, you can tell that he's doing a lot of improvising and that's what we're gonna try to do. The progression isn't even over yet. We've, that's only four chords. So for the first part of the melody, it was F sharp minor and C sharp seven. Then we moved it down two frets to the left. Play the same scale shape. Now right here, when it goes to C, now it's up to you to improvise using this scale shape that we did. The problem though is going to be when the B7 and the D sharp diminished seventh chord roll around. And that is an example of the harmonic minor scale. Let's go back to the beginning though. We had these chords, F sharp minor. I'm playing it in a new way that you probably wouldn't do if you're strumming because you would want to go way up here. So it's F sharp minor and then it's C sharp seven. Now if you notice right here where my middle finger is, that note is not in the scale that we played. We started with this. Scale we first talked about here. Those are all the notes. 
Now when C-sharp dominant seventh rolls around, we have to alter a note. Instead of playing this one, we have to raise it up one fret. That means the octave of that note below it. Uh, we also have to raise that up. So that changes the scale uh, into this. There it is again, if you want to grab that high note. And that is Phrygian dominant, if we were going to write a whole melody or song based on that C-sharp note. That's what they would call that. Phrygian dominant is just the fifth mode of the harmonic minor scale, if you know what the harmonic minor scale is. But that's just a Latin sounding thing, right? So you just have to be careful of that. If you do play that note instead of that one, it still will sound okay, but it sounds more like you're conforming to what the chords are if you play this note. So if you can see the arpeggio of this chord, that's also very helpful. And you can just plug that into the shape. So when you're improvising over this, we can use just the straight scale that we learned at the beginning. Okay, I'm just playing randomly. And then when that next chord rolls around, C sharp seven, maybe highlight that note to tell the listener that yes, you do know what the chords are. Or you could avoid either of those notes and that's fine too, which he does in the melody. He goes. He doesn't hit the note that makes it the harmonic minor scale. He hits this note, which is the fifth of that chord. And that sounds great. And it's not a new note in the scale. It was already there anyway. So that's only the first four measures, two chords of this progression. The whole rest of the progression moves down to the left, as we already saw. And we're gonna play that scale here. But now we have two instances where we have to watch out for that harmonic minor thing. And when you're improvising over this, be sure to include as many things as you can think of. Don't just play the notes dry like this. Think of different ways that you can play the note. Hammer-ons and pull-offs, slides. Uh, vibrato and things like that that makes things really come alive because I see a lot of people just playing up and down with this is piccolo technique index and middle rest strokes. you could use your thumb that gives you a different sound you, in this key we can really play off the open strings what, what about doing that off the E string all kinds of stuff you can do in the key of E minor definitely but what I'm getting at is that you can make things sound more three-dimensional if you do some embellishments and slurs in there and I think a really great one would be to do this Little things like that really go a long way. So if I'm playing these three notes from the scale, we could call that an upper mordant where we're just playing this note and going to the next note in the scale. These two spots in that scale where we have these half steps are great places to do that um, because it really capitalizes on a strong finger. If it were the other way around, like for example on this one, a little bit harder because that's ring finger's weaker or certainly the pinky weaker still, but that's absolutely worth doing. But these are really like cardinal points in that scale and because they actually lead into the root of the whole scale. So really try to work things like that in. I think that really sounds great. And he's doing it on the record. So in the second part of the progression, we're in the key of E minor. We have an E minor chord. Any notes that we want. Of course, if you can see the arpeggios and they're all inside that scale shape, here's E minor, next chord's a B7. There's a C chord in there, it's right there under your fingers, absolutely in there. A minor's also there. There it is. You don't have to be able to see all these, but I would encourage you to try to do that. If you can see those arpeggios, that really informs where you might land when you punctuate a phrase or when you kind of end a little riff that you're playing. And the next chord after A minor is D sharp diminished seventh. There it is right there, and then we got our B7, they're all happening in there. But all we really have to worry about is the diminished chord, D sharp diminished, and B7. Now they perform the same function. D sharp diminished seventh is a substitute, a diminished seventh substitute for B7. So just think of it as a B7. So we have E minor, playing in our scale notes, then here comes B7, watch out for that note. Really important, we have an instant Spanish sound by doing that. Then we're going over to C, we can forget that note now, we'll go back to the normal scale. Okay, here's A minor, don't have to change anything there. It would be good if you could land on a note in the chord, but um, we can't have it all. And D sharp rolls around, D sharp diminished seventh. Think of that as B7, there's my D sharp note. Then B7 is the next chord, so you can just be in that mode where we're thinking of, in this case, making all of our D natural notes D sharp. Then it goes back and we have to scoot up two frets. So this is such a great progression to practice improvising because you have to listen for when it's over. A lot of times when we're practicing improvising, we're staying in one key and we're just playing up and down the neck. We're not really thinking about the chords like we should and we're not listening like we should. This song really makes you listen not only for the amount of time when the progression's over, but you can hear when the key changes back to the key of F sharp minor and you gotta be ready for it and just move that scale shape up. If you know other scale shapes, we should be trying to do this all over the neck. But in this video, I'm, I'm just trying to get this shape going and we can just move this around. And remember, no matter what song it is, any song you've ever heard in your life, this scale shape is there somewhere on the neck. You just need to know where it is.
Okay, now it's time for you to practice all of this stuff, playing the chords with me, playing that opening riff, playing the opening melody, and improvising over the chords. Now you know how to play the chords to Morea, the opening riff, the main melody, and hopefully how to improvise. Practicing playing scales and improvising with chord progression loops and backing tracks is such a great way to practice. We're working on our timing, our musicality, theory, and all these different techniques like hammer-ons, pull-offs, and all those things. But we're not really thinking of that as we do it, and that means you're going to practice it for longer than you would if you did an actual drill, and that means you're going to get better sooner. Be sure to download my Morea worksheet, and I'll see you in the next video.